such that to his tormentors he would boldly declare these words. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. Today's Palm Sunday, where we remember the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem as the celebrated king riding a donkey. People lined the streets to sing his praises, but our Lord, who knew that these same fickle crowds would soon shout, Crucify him! Crucify him! Our Lord extended grace, knowing that in spite of it all, God's love would endure. Knowing that he would declare, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. While eating the last, the final meal, the last supper, that he would share with his disciples before his trial and death, Jesus knows that Judas has already made a deal to betray him. Yet because he knew God's love indoors, Jesus could keep his eyes on the joy set before him, resting in the words he would soon declare. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. As he prayed to his father in the garden, discovering that pff, his disciples had failed to even stay awake and pray. They were instead sleeping. And Jesus, even while knowing that the cup would not be removed, shaped his will to the will of the Father by communicating honestly and openly, saying, Father, if, if, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Scripture tells us he was in such agony that his sweat became like drops of blood. Yet he was sustained by knowing God's love endures. It's not hard to imagine that some of the words spoken to him by the angels who ministered to him reminded him of the reality that it wasn't going to be long before he would be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. As he received the kiss of betrayal, of one of his disciples turning him over to the armed captors. And as his disciples fled into the protection of the night, Jesus remained full of quiet faith, knowing he would experience soon what he soon spoke from now on. The Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. Later that night, as the madness unfolded around him, took on a life of its own, and he witnessed Peter denying having anything to do with him and denied even knowing him, Jesus kept walking toward his death, radiating the light of his faith that God's love would endure. That God will fulfill the promise that from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. In my lifetime of preaching, I don't know that I've ever, in the opening six minutes of a message repeated the same biblical phrase seven times. So why did I do it this morning? If we don't get this concept out of our head, 
down into believing it in our spirit, in our soul. We're not going to have the faith to endure the hard times. So I testified at uh, Connor's dad's funeral that when Connor suggested to his dad that you know, he might enjoy coming into Pastor Bob's office and giving his life story, and Larry did, and I had the privilege of meeting him. Delightful man. And I asked him at one point, I said, I said Larry, have you, ever, have you ever made a commitment to Christ? He'd use the language, when the cancer wins. And I said, when the cancer wins, do you know that, you're, that you are safe with God? And his, his, his face just lit up, and just radiated. He said, I have given my life to Christ, and I know where I will go. He acknowledged a, um, some regrets. We all have them. But his life radiated confidence. The confidence that takes a belief that shows that a head belief has gone down into the DNA of the soul. All of us who knew Lois admired the way that she lived the past 10 years with her diagnosis of cancer. We watched this woman, I'm told, who never complained. And I never heard her complain. She radiated, trusted God. She invested in people. She lived with dynamism, even as the cancer kept showing up again and again and again and even as it became clear at the end that her life on this side of glory was rapidly coming to an end. Frida shared with me um, the day after um, Lois passed that Frida had opportunity to again be um, at Lois's side and ministering to her, blessing her. And one of the things she said to God stirring her to affirm to Lois was Paul's words in 2 Timothy. Say, Lois, you have, you have fought the good fight. You've, you've finished the race. You've kept the faith. And Lois, with hardly any strength left whispered God has been so faithful he's been so faithful there would have been multiple opportunities for Lois to have focused on all that she had lost But she had let the Holy Spirit take that belief, understanding deep down into her soul such that she knew in whose hands she was returning. She knew who held her destiny. So my prayer is that we too we might increase our confidence that because of the resurrection of Jesus triumphing over sin and death and knowing Christ's promise that we too will be raised with him to new life that we can take that conceptual embracing of truth into our deep places of the soul so that when we face trials or difficulties we will embrace at that deeper level knowing God's love is going to win. God's love endures. Knowing that our Lord is now seated at the right hand 
of the mighty God. Releasing into our lives the Holy Spirit to guide and empower, to help us live well. No matter what life throws at us. Until the day he shepherds us through the valley of the shadow of death into sharing his eternal reward. We never know when the surprises are going to um, confront us. The last number of weeks were unusually intense with members of the congregation in the community needing uh, ministry. And so Monday was my day off and it was a beautiful day. And I decided to, I'm going to leave my cell phone behind. I'm not going to be available. I'm going to go down to Warwick Park with my fishing line and I'm going to see if I can catch my limit of five trout so that we can have trout for dinner Monday night. So I went down and I walked uh, up through towards the spot that I've had good success at before and at least catching the first one or two. And as I come around the bend, I saw there was an older man already fishing that hole. And then I saw um, another man um, further up the stream and I didn't bother looking. I just knew I wasn't going to go above further. So I thought, well, I'll start here at the bridge because I've had some success here and I cast and almost immediately um, a trout hit, but I didn't successfully set the hook. And so I tried again and about my third or fourth cast, it caught on something about two thirds of the way across the street. And I couldn't get it loose and didn't want to break my line. I have waders, so I waded through where I'd wanted to catch a fish. Uh, over to the other side to loosen and this man, not the one at the hole closest to me, but further up the stream, yells at me. Don't you see the signs? That's private property. You're not allowed on that side of the stream. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I hollered back. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I said, no, I, I don't see any signs. And I said, I've, you know, I've I just came to fish. I'm not trying to make trouble. And he yelled again. He said, that's my property and it's posted. And the guy between us, bless his heart, turns and says to the guy, he's not on the bank. He's in the stream. What's your problem? <laughs> and the guy yells again. He says, you lawbreaker. You're lucky I don't have my gun. Well, in the middle of that, I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I know that voice. It was one of my hunting buddies who recognized me walking up to the fishing hole. I hadn't looked at him. And he was pulling my leg. So we had a really good laugh together. And then I went down the stream and got my five fish. I'm hoping before he got his, but I didn't talk to him afterwards. <laughs> Not a member of this congregation, by the way. <laughs> Worship's in another Mennonite congregation. I'll have to get that pastor after him. <laughs> it was great fun. But I thought about it afterwards. You know, 10 years ago, if somebody had yelled like that, I would have immediately thought, all right, who's that? I know the person. But we live in such a polarized time that he hooked me in. And I, you know, I literally believed I'm getting yelled at for doing something wrong. So, you know, that time it wasn't for real. It gave us all a good laugh. But there are times that we get yelled at. Times we get cursed unfairly. Times we're actually betrayed by someone we've lo we love. So as you think about the pain of those times and then multiply it by all of the sins of the world and all of this betrayals and stuff going on with Jesus, imagine. I mean, he had the power. He could have struck Judas and the others. He could have struck them dead right there. 
But he didn't. He could have called on legions of angels, the scriptures tell us, to rescue him from this path of pain. But he did not. This rejection of revenge by our Lord, it ought to um, bring you and I a lot of comfort. Because we too have sinned against God. We've broken God's laws. We've denied Jesus. We've betrayed him. But he does not sit on the edge of his seat waiting for the right time to destroy us. That's not his motivation. Instead, as proclaimed 2 Peter 3, 9, he's patient with us, not willing for any of us to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Even if you were never one who liked the disciples literally ran away from Jesus, might we not all acknowledge there have been times where we, like Peter, we followed Jesus from a distance. Why do we so easily fail our Lord? Is it not rooted too often in our tendency to not stay close enough to Jesus, not staying connected to the vine that nourishes us, that sustains us. We're too often satisfied with occasionally checking in. But as Peter found out, we cannot be filled with the Spirit of God when we keep our distance from God. So for any today who are tired of living a dry, empty life of spiritual failure, let today be the day you commit, maybe anew, maybe once again, but you commit to worshiping him more regularly, to loving him more deeply, by loving his children, to call upon his anointing consistently, daily, regularly for cleansing, rather than following him from a distance. Let today be the day we all embrace the truth more deeply that this Lord who walked faithfully toward the cross is now seated at the right hand of the mighty God, interceding for us, advocating for us. such that we might also win the race and share in his glory. God knew that you and I and every person that ever lived would sin against him and thereby receive the curse of death upon us. But God the Father and Jesus the Son conspired together that the Son would enter into the human condition, would enter into the flesh they had created in order to show us the love of the Father and through the sacrifice of love bridge the gap separating us from God's love. All ours, this redemption, restoration, forgiveness, if we will but turn from our sin and accept his forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way, he made him who knew no sin, made him to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So as Jesus was dying on the cross, filled up with the sins of all humanity, 
he became the living carrier of all sin. So that after resurrection proved the power of God over even sin and death, Jesus could indeed be seated at the right hand of the mighty God praying on our behalf, releasing into our lives as we call it forth the Holy Spirit to guide, protect, equip, and empower. In a time like these past weeks where so many of our families have been faced anew with the reality of hardship, death, and dying, it's comforting to remember that for a time, our Lord, our Lord, lay in the darkness of the tomb. Our Lord occupied that place and space of death. Comforting, not because remembrance is the end of the story, but precisely because it is not. So when our Lord declared, from now on the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God, the space between the declaration of faith and its fulfillment, and we know from our own lives there's normally space between the declaration and the fulfillment. Sometimes there's long years of space. That space between declaration and fulfillment that includes trauma, even the silence of death, it has been shattered by the good news declaration of an empty tomb. He's risen. He is risen indeed. We always open next Sunday morning our Easter celebration worship with those words. He is risen. And the congregation responds, He is risen indeed. So in this final week, before we celebrate a new profoundly good news of Easter morning, many of us will gather at the sunrise service, 6 o'clock in the morning. Joy Beam will share a short devotions. Sharon will open and Jody will with the recording, lead us in adding our voices of praise, and then we get to come back for a breakfast. So in this final week, before we celebrate, let's pause. Find a niche of time to wonder a bit. Reflect a while. How different is your life? And if you can't quickly name how it's different, repent of that. How different is life? Because our Lord declared, I am the resurrection and the life. And then stayed faithful to the Father until he proved the declaration as fact. As a congregation, we've shaped our 2019 Lenten journey around the Leader Magazine resource. It recognizes we have within us a hungering to know God more deeply. It's a blessed hunger. It's a blessed hunger when we let it lead us to the Holy Feast that we will find if we but turn to God. And today that hunger is satisfied as we embrace anew that God's love endures such that our Lord now sits on a throne of authority at the right hand of the mighty God looking out for us 
Amen? Amen. Amen.